Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Heather Nenninger with Natural Resources Conservation Service and the Montana Association of Conservation Districts will be talking about greater sage grouse conservation on Montana's working lands. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Stay tuned for our upcoming Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars. On October 18th at noon, Peter Joyce with the Saskatchewan Ministry of the Environment will be talking about the Prairie Mitigation Guide. Don't miss Autumn Watkinson's presentation about sage grouse habitat restoration on November 29th at noon. Details will be posted for both of these webinars on the PCAP website in the near future. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by Environment Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the Montana Association of Conservation Districts. Just a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Now, a bit about our presenter. Heather has been in Forsyth, Montana as a range and wildlife conservationist with SWCDM for two years. Prior to that, Heather worked solely in the Northern Great Plains, first on a project examining the relationship between grazing and grassland songbirds just south of Grasslands National Park, and then earning her master's from the University of Manitoba, where her thesis focused on the effects of conventional oil production on the abundance of grassland songbirds in Brooks, Alberta. And now I will turn it over to, to Heather. Heather, are you there? I am. Can you all see my screen now? Um, no. Yep, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Good. Alrighty, so I can't tell. Is the little webinar tab still there? Can I put that? We can't see that, we just see your slides. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, so uh, thanks for that introduction and I'm really happy that I could uh, give this talk today and thanks for inviting me to do that. Um, so basically what I'm gonna focus on, um, as the title mentions, the conservation of sage grouse on Montana's working lands, and specifically the ranch lands. And I'm gonna be looking at this through the lens um, of the sage grouse initiative. Uh, so the talk today will kind of consist of going over some basics first about greater sage grouse um, biology and kind of what the bird is and what they require, um, and then going over the basics of the sage grouse initiative, how it got started, uh, why, and then we'll jump into uh, specifically what's going on in Montana um, and how we've been successful using the sage grouse initiative to conserve uh, millions of acres of sagebrush and sagebrush ecosystem. So with that, um, and there we go. So the sage grouse is a chicken sized bird uh, that lives as its name implies primarily in sagebrush. Uh, its name also partially comes from the fact that its diet in winter is typically out of sagebrush. Uh, sagebrush actually don't have a crop unlike other birds, they can't really process seeds at all, although they will eat forbs and insects um, in the springtime. And sage grouse is really known for its lecking behavior. And the lek is where the male sage grouse will go and uh, do their mating display. It's called their dancing, stomping, booming. Uh, this grouse in the picture is displaying that for you all nicely. Uh, and they do that every year, um, usually on either the same lek location or very close to where they had previously. Um, they'll do that from about late March to early May, from about uh, half an hour before sunrise to four hours after. So it's this very short window that they're doing, displaying this behavior, but it's definitely um, helped them make a name for themselves. So as I mentioned, they require uh, sage brush. And 
It's actually a lar fairly large, like you can see in the background here. All these guys are dancing. Um, so large amounts of sage is the biggest requirement for them. Uh, they're not terribly picky within that native sage grits, native sage lands um, is really what they're after. And this habitat requirement they have makes them a very good umbrella species in that if we are conserving uh, sagebrush habitat, large tracts of sagebrush habitat, we're conserving habitat for over 300 species that also use this habitat, including you know game species, mule deer, elk, uh, other sharp-tailed grouse, um, as well as songbirds and uh, herps. Um, so two of the songbirds specifically that are really scientifically uh, shown that has an increase where we have sage grouse um, initiative acres is the brewer sparrows and the green-tailed towhee. Um, and there's information about that on the sage grouse initiative website. So the former range um, of the sage grass is shown in this light green here. And you can see that they extended to 11 Western states as well as uh, three Canadian provinces. Um, unfortunately, most of them uh, have been extirpated from Canada. Uh, the states have fared a bit better, although you can see areas like the Columbia Basin in Washington and Oregon, uh, the range has constricted quite a bit as well as in uh, around Montana area too. A lot of that um, was due to farming, cropland conversion, especially um, in this Columbia Basin area. And this is the Golden Triangle um, area of Montana, which is known for its wheat production. So the decline has been observed, um, or at least notably observed since 1916. That's when we first start hearing of people Saying that the sage grass is going to go extinct if we don't do anything. Um, so like I said, the cropland conversion, um, extraction of minerals and natural gas, uh, ex-urban development, which is kind of the fancy way of saying suburbia, popping up along the edges of cities and towns and um, small ranchettes of you know, the five to 20 acre variety appearing as well. Um, and then fire has been a big one, especially this last year. Um, so Fire isn't necessarily uh, the end of sagebrush habitat, but it does depend a lot on the variety of sagebrush that you have. Silver sage, which is found um, in Canada and northern Montana, actually recovers fairly quickly from fire. It can regrow from the same root system. <clears throat> Big sage, on the other hand, uh, doesn't really have that capability, so it'll take decades for uh, system with big sagebrush or Wyoming big sagebrush to recover from the fire. So all of this decline led to um, the for or Fish and Wildlife Service of the U.S. being forced to make a decision about if they were going to list sage grass. And what they came up with was this warranted but precluded listing, which in layman's terms basically means that the grouse should be listed, but there's other priorities. We don't have the resources to list it at the time, and there's species that are in more need of listing. Um, so this happened in 2010, and it kind of sent uh, the conservation area world and uh, a lot of the developments that'd be affected by an actual listing, so oil and gas and um, ranchers, into this frenzy uh, to find a solution to this bird the threat of this bird being on put on the endangered species list. And what came out of that was a sage grouse initiative. Um, it was developed to be adaptive, science-driven management. Um, and like I said, the decision of warranted but precluded came along with it a kind of frenzy of uh, interest and of studies kind of popping up. So we've had because of that decision, um, multiple studies and year-long studies on sage grouse that have occurred and that have, that's helped sage grouse initiative kind of keep with that science-driven management part. Um, we've had uh, multiple cases of the, some of the science showing um, that maybe what we thought is always the case is not uh, so, especially with when it comes to grazing. So it's been really helpful to have uh, a plan in place for how we can change 
um, what we're doing on the ground based off what's coming from the science. So it's a bit convoluted, so I wanted to go over how SGI operates. Um, so the United States has the Department of Agriculture, which within it is the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is probably the largest organization of the government that works directly with landowners. Um, NRCS since the 30s, it was, it was a project of the, or a product of the Dust Bowl, uh, has helped landowners um, with their soil health, uh, with water quality, uh, all of these things that kind of help a rancher or a farmer have better sustainability on their own land and also generally tends to help the ecosystem. So NRCS, one of the programs that they uh, use is EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And SGI falls, for the most part, falls under that. When we talk about SGI contracts, they're a type of EQIP. They're a type of um, this contract that's been used for decades to help ranchers and farmers better their practices um, and better the health of their land. So SGI has been in place since 2010. Um, and since the time, that time, across those 11 states, 11 Western states, they've improved grazing plans on 2.7 million acres, placed over 450,000 acres under conservation easements, um, marked or moved 628 miles of high-risk fences to reduce grouse collisions, and also conserved 12,000 acres of wet meadow and riparian habitat. So we'll kind of go into what all of these practices entail later in the show. Oh, and I do want to point out one of the Sage Grouse Initiative's logos, which is wildlife conservation through sustainable ranching. Um, I'll probably make this point several times throughout the presentation, but the big reason that SGI has been so successful is that it is a win for both wildlife and ranchers and folks that make a living off the land. Um, it would not be the success that it is if it wasn't beneficial to both those parties. So, because of, in part, to all of the success that SGI had, uh, sage grouse avoided an endangered species listing that happened in the fall of 2015. Um, but sage grouse initiative, with that, it was never the goal to simply avoid listing. We wanted to continue um, to practice good grazing management, good rangeland management. And so even though it was listed in 2015, SGI has continued on. Um, and kind of a part of that is that poor grazing was thought to be um, a threat to sage grouse. So the continuance of SGI was kind of a natural thing um, because that was a big part of uh, what SGI was doing on the ground was improving grazing management. So now we'll get into uh, sage grouse specifically in Montana and how SGI has been working in Montana. Um, Montana has quite a bit of habitat, uh, about 33 million acres of suitable habitat for sage grouse, and about two thirds of that is on non federal land, which is another reason why um, that SGI under NRCS is so important because NRCS works, um, has a history of working with private landowners to do practices on private land, and that is where the need was. Um, so, sage grouse. Um, initiative was, oops, sorry, uh, there we go. So the Sage Grouse Initiative, as part of that, the Montana uh, State Department of Fish and Wildlife and Parks uh, created this map which you're seeing here. We have the historic range, the general habitat, and then we have what's called core areas. And this is where 75% of the breeding population of sage grouse is within about 25% of the habitat. So we have 14 core areas in Montana, which are these blue areas. Um, and for reference, I think y'all can see the mouse, but um, I'm located in the southern portion of what's called core area six in Rosebud County. So the idea with the core areas is, yeah, so you have 75% of the breeding population with a 9.6 million acres. And this makes a difference in triage, and we want to focus where we're gonna get the most bang for our buck. So we wanna focus our efforts in these core areas uh, 
still would like to do projects and have done projects in general habitat as well. But all things considered equal, when we're doing a plan through SGI, um, if it's a choice between funding something in general habitat or core habitat, that core habitat project is gonna get funded. So start, part of the planning process, we have what's called the threat checklist, the sage grass threat checklist. Um, it's not that all ranches have every single threat that's on this list, um, and not necessarily all threats are gonna get addressed for various reasons, but we look to try to fund the projects that address as many of the threats possible or as, uh, as many of the threats that are on their ranch. Um, so we'll go through them real quick here and then into detail. One of the threats is fences within 0.6 miles of a lek or passing through important winter habitat, um, stock water tanks without escape ramps, noxious weeds or invasive species, uh, invasive vegetative species, those those parts there, uh, significant conifer, conifer encroachment, predator subsidies, grazing management that does not allow for improving residual cover in nesting habitat, or increasing range sustainability, and mesic areas that are dewatered and fail to provide adequate brood habitat. And all of these threats have solutions available within the SGI plan that are cost shared, meaning that NRCS helps fund uh, whatever solutions that the rancher and the planner come up with um, to try to kind of take the bite out of doing this many changes on a ranch. So to start with, we have the fence marking. Um, so the reason for this is that sage grouse, they said, are chicken-sized birds and that would have the brain if you think of it that way. Uh, so they will run into fences. Um, it's unfortunate because they can't really see those wires, especially it seems anecdotally the new wire that's put out with new steel post fence seems to be a significant issue. Um, so we, or Sage also should help develop uh, the idea of these markers, marking fences. And all this is is vinyl siding that's cut into about three inch chunks and put every few feet on the top wire of a fence that fits the criteria that I mentioned earlier with within 0.6 miles of a lek or if the fence passes through important winter habitat. Um, there are some exceptions. Um, if, at least in my area, we've done it. If the sage grouse is extremely tall and is for the most part to the height of the fence, we don't generally worry about marking because the sage grouse are gonna be over, flying over that height anyways. Um, and I guess by far marking is one of the ones we get pushback from ranchers from. A lot of folks think that the marking isn't particularly pretty, uh, which I won't argue with them there. And I do hear a lot, well, you know, I never see birds in my fence. I've never seen a sage grouse uh, hit the fence. And I think part of that uh, comes from not realizing that most of our fence strikes look like this, where we have a few feathers, um, and some skin remnants just hanging on the barbed wire fence. Sometimes we're able to find the sage grouse within 20, 40, 50 feet of the fence and other times not. Uh, but either way, you're, if you're hitting a fence hard enough to leave skin and feathers behind, um, bird probably isn't doing too well after that. So the escape ramps, which there's one installed in this tank here in the bottom right, this little uh, blue metal mesh. Um, and this is one thing that ranchers are generally more than happy to do uh, because nobody likes coming to the water tank and finding, oh, there we go, uh, and finding dead critters in it. That's both a small songbird and a chipmunk that managed to get into a tank and weren't able to get out. And this is fairly commonplace. Um, I've never talked to a rancher that hasn't had to pull critters out of the tank. Uh, and <laughs> I had one who talked about, you know, he was fairly easily convinced of escape ramps and putting how putting them in was gonna be a good thing, um, especially after he found a dead skunk in one of his tanks, which nobody wants to deal with that. So escape ramps are something that goes in every single one of our sage grouse initiative plans. Uh, it's just an easy thing to do that helps sage grouse and other critters uh, not die. 
So next we had noxious weeds, and there are certainly noxious weeds that are common in the area. Canada thistle and leafy scourge are probably two of the most prominent, um, at least in my immediate area. Neither of these are a very big deal when it comes to sage grouse, though. Um, by far, actually, our issue is not a noxious weed, uh, but it is cheatgrass and field or Japanese broom, which is shown in the picture there. Uh, this particularly uh, has been an issue with the fire, um, fire seasons we've been having. Both of these grasses dry up very quickly, um, probably greening up in February to April, depending on the year, and drying up within a few weeks. So it's pretty good fire starter material in a dry year. Uh, they also are very poor forage, um, so they're not really, you know, the rancher isn't getting anything from having these weeds out there, uh, and they don't provide a lot of litter, so they're not going to improve the range at all by just having this massive amount of cheatgrass and Japanese brome. Um, so they're really not good on any level. Uh, and part of this notch or cheatgrass and Japanese brome uh, is mostly we try to deal with by our grazing management, which again, I'll get into in just a bit. So another one I don't see too much of in my area, uh, but is conifer encroachment. Uh, recent science has shown that as little as 4% cover of conifers, either most common kind of are ponderosa pine, uh, pinion pine, and uh, juniper, as little as 4% cover and the birds start leaving. Um, which seems absurdly small amount of cover, but that's what the science is showing. And it seems to coordinate with line of sight. If the birds can't see this big open expanse, then they're not interested in nesting there, um, which seems to make sense if you wanna be, want be able to see all the predators that might be coming at you. Um, so this is most often dealt with mechanical treatment. So chopping, lopping, uh, chopping the trees down, often either piling them uh, into small burn piles, or just making them short enough to the where they no longer are affecting that visual on the horizon. Uh, they're not uh, looking like trees anymore to the birds. Uh, beyond just the birds wanting to leave, if there's too much conifer cover, uh, there's generally less water on the landscape. Trees take up a lot of water and don't leave necessarily a whole lot left for reserves and drought. Um, and the snow is actually gone earlier. That was a recent science study um, that's avail also available on that Sage Grass Initiative website. So Eastern Montana is not really known for its conifers. We do have them, uh, but by far uh, this area and the southwestern portion of the state where we have a few poor areas is where most of the conifer encroachment um, contracts take place. The next one is predator subsidies. And predator subsidies are basically any type of structure that allows predators to encroach into um, a type that they maybe wouldn't previously have been either living in the middle of, or maybe they would just been on the edge. Uh, one of the most frequent examples of this is power lines and telephone lines. And these are issues for a couple of reasons. One's birds like ravens uh, can readily build nests on power lines, and they're probably one of the biggest uh, nest predators that sage grouse have. And also, uh, telephone posts as well as other structures make great perching points for raptors. Um, this is a ferruginous hawk, hawk pictured, which probably isn't a huge threat to an adult sage grouse, but I will quite often in my area see golden eagles perched uh, on a pole, unfortunately, one of the most popular places is right above where a lick location is, uh, but they will happily sit there all day long and wait for a sage grouse. Um, so telephone poles are a big one. Of course, we don't expect the landowner to deal with poles that he doesn't own, um, but for smaller, uh, for ones that are under his control, we generally try to persuade them that to bury the lines or if those power poles are no longer in use to get rid of them. Other predator subsidies that maybe aren't really thought of as much as any, anything a predator can make in home. And so even this old car uh, could be a haven to a skunk, um, which is another nest predator. Old barns you have, uh, or other structures 
are hosts for both avian and mammalian predators. Um, and then even just junk piles, it's something, again, that a skunk or a raccoon or any of the other uh, critters could make a home in and could help them kind of thrive on the prairie where they otherwise might not have been able to find a home quite as easily. So you might notice that the barn is looking fairly old um, and certainly many ranchers don't want to take down uh, these kind of historical uh, barns and homes and we do have um, ways of dealing with that. Anything older than 50 years is considered a cultural resource and so we have to go through special steps to make sure um, that we are taking that most care with what we're going to hopefully demolish and trying to balance the cultural significance versus the ecosystem needs. So now we're getting into the meat of SGI, uh, especially in Montana, this is grazing management is by far the most important thing, important thing I think that we do. Um, grazing management, we the way that we do it, it's beneficial not only for the birds, but for the cows. And that's, again, one of the reasons that SGI works, or really the big reason that SGI works, is that it has to be good for both um, the landowner and the bird. Uh, it's beneficial for the cows because basically what we're trying to do with this grazing management is grow more grass and more types of grass, uh, which just makes the range more sustainable for the future. So one of the... Um, benchmarks of our grazing management plans is changing the season of use. Uh, there's, so season of use is we're trying to change that so we don't have the same plants getting hit at the same time every single year. Uh, there's a history of season long grazing here so you have maybe a summer pasture, a fall pasture, winter pasture or something along those lines. Um, and this really can limit grass growth especially because of the biology of grasses with the warm seasons versus cool seasons. We have a warm season, little blue stem on the right, and the western wheat grass, cool season on the left. Um, so cool seasons are generally growing, as the name implies, when it's cooler versus warm seasons during the height of summer. And for example, uh, this happened with one of the ranches that we worked with. They had issues with their winter pasture being covered in little blue stem um, and the cows wouldn't eat it. And what was happening was that the cows weren't in the pasture when the little blue stem was tender um, and had young shoots and that was in the summer and by the time they got around to actually being around it in the winter it was wolfy and tough and the cows wanted nothing to do with it uh, so simply changing the season of use there helps um, helped the cows graze the little blue stem when it was more palatable to them and actually um, can help change diversity there uh, the other reason that you want to be considered of cool versus warm seasons is that you want to be able to take advantage of all rain whenever it comes. Um, if you only have cool seasons, rain that falls during the summer isn't really necessarily going to help you and vice versa for the warm seasons. Uh, we are mostly cool seasons throughout Montana, uh, but we still, again, diversity, diversity is almost never a bad thing, um, especially when it's native species. So being able to have both of those available um, and helpful for both the cow and the bird. The other benchmark of the, all of our grazing plants is to have less than 45 days grazing in a single pasture. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have a history of season long grazing where you're grazing in a single pasture for 90 days. Uh, and that really um, limits your recovery time in a pasture because if in, your, in, re, in a pasture for three to six months, you only have you know, six to nine months to grow back grass for your cows to eat uh, versus if you're in there for ideally a month or less but we do extend it out to 45 days you're really giving that grass uh, a better chance to grow um so the way um that grazing has been done previously with that seasonal grazing is that they would have often split herds with multiple summer pastures um so that would lead to uh Kind of issue of overgrazing versus regrazing. So they split up their herds because they didn't want to have, didn't want to overgraze, which is kind of the picture shown here is kind of I think what people classically think is the issue with grazing um, is overgrazing. And that's what folks were avoiding earlier by splitting the herd and having multiple summer pastures. They weren't having overgrazing, but they were having regrazing. 
Um, the difference there being that regrazing, you might have plenty of AUMs, plenty of grass to get you through the season, but the cows, especially um, when it's hot and dry like it has been this year, will continue to go back to the same places. And that's generally mesic areas or riparian areas. So they go back, graze it. As soon as the grass grows up another few inches, go back and graze it again. And that's extremely detrimental to the plant and really uh, decreases the plant's vigor and will eventually decrease how much of that plant is there. Um, so, like I said, it's especially seen in mesic areas, and you can see a history of that here along the side, the right side of the bank, how much regrazing has happened there, and even in the central uh, stream, it's certainly greener there, but how short that grass is, um, considering this was taken in July-ish, so that grass should have all been uh, at least a foot to two feet tall, um, and it's probably only four to six inches here because the cows keep coming back. And like I said, this is especially prevalent in hot and dry years. And this is a problem because mythic areas are extremely important to greater sage grouse, especially during the brooding season. Um, but I'll get to that in a minute. So what this um, grazing management is really about is trying to increase your grazing distribution. And this is something ranchers know um, generally is a problem on their place. They see that areas um, don't get grazed for years at a time and that other areas get grazed continuously. Um, and to them, that kind of, how I've heard one say it is that, you know, you're paying lease or taxes on land that you're not using, which is not a win for them. Um, so the question becomes, how do we uh, change grazing distribution? And often that is done, uh, with cross fencing. So this is where we, another place where we try to balance what um, the rancher needs for the grazing distribution to improve that grazing, to improve that grazing management, and what's better for the bird. Because as I mentioned before, birds will hit fences. Um, all of our new fences do have marking on them, but that they are still a barrier, um, not only to sage grouse, but to ungulates. But at the same time, we do want to improve this grazing management. Um, and fence, our fence technology is getting better. Uh, we are capable of having electric fences kind of in the middle of nowhere at this point because of solar panels. Um, the electric fences are definitely more penetrable um, than traditional barbed wire fence. Although I should mention that all of our new barbed wire fences that go in are, do meet specifications for wildlife friendly. Um, so, the other way that we can uh, distribute grazing better is water. Um, as I had mentioned previously, a lot of the areas that are regrazed are in mesic areas or also often near water because cows, like most critters, are inherently lazy and they don't want to have to work any harder than they have to get uh, their food and the water in their shelter. So we are able to do different tank types. This is a tire tank, old recycled tire. Um, we also do fiberglass tanks um, and kind of, so those are traditionally runoff wells, although we can develop springs, um, specific, especially if they don't have a big wetland value or if they're already getting damaged because the cows are coming into the spring to drink water. And it doesn't show it here, but you'll often get uh, the humping that happens in springs from the cattle hoof action. So if there's any way that we can uh, develop a spring, get the cows off that spring, that's certainly an option as well. Um, because it's been historically been easier to have water in the lowlands, uh, water is often needed in the uplands, and that's where the distribution often um, is really lacking is in those uplands. So these have really been a boon to ranchers to get water spread out throughout their property. Oh, and I did forget to mention, um, besides splitting pastures, uh, especially if there's large pastures, we have some that are over 10,000 acres. Um, another option is to combine herds. I mentioned that historically uh, a lot of folks have done split herds and run multiple herds through their different pastures, um, but when you're able to combine them you can be in a pasture for a short amount of time, still get all your grass, and then you're continuing to give it that longer period of rest. Um, so with water we have seen a sign or moving away from reservoirs and pits. Um, 
we have a lot of issues with those things failing. Uh, so ranchers are a little bit more leery of them, it seems. Um, and this again might be a good thing for the grouse, uh, as well as West Nile is still certainly a threat um, in some of these areas. And tanks are a little bit better in that case than that they can be turned off so you can drain the water when they're not in use and you don't have uh, the issues with mosquitoes breeding there. So all of this water uh, that we're putting on just even to distribute grazing better helps combat our last threat, which is um, the one of mesic areas degrading. Um, and you can see, although this mesic area looks pretty good with all the grass and forbs that are growing along the edges, you can see that it is down cutting, visible kind of here in the center of the screen where the banks are exposed and not growing any vegetation. Um, yeah, so more water means you're putting less pressure on your mesic areas. The cows aren't necessarily going to be hanging out there uh, the entire time that they're in the pasture, which, as I mentioned before, is extremely important for uh, our grass or <laughs> sage grass. Um, in Montana, specifically in my area, mesic or the lack of mesic or riparian areas is probably what is limiting our grass sage grass population. Um, there just isn't a lot of these areas that haven't been degraded or aren't down cutting. Um, so, and why that's an issue is because these habitats provide food for broods and brood rearing habitat. Um, I mentioned that sage grass don't have crops, so that limits them to insects and forbs. And you find the most insects and forbs wherever there's water. So in dry areas, while they might still have forbs, really lack the forb diversity and lack specifically succulent forbs, which is what these chicks are really feeding on. Um, so way to demonstrate this, or uh, another reason why that the mesic areas are so important is that, so if we have, for example, um, a lek at this green star and all of this, everywhere where there is a color other than white is some sort of mesic area. Red just means that it is dry more years than not. Um, so the farther that this, uh, say, or sorry, not a lek, but a nest. Um, so the farther this mom has to go with her chicks, the more exposed she is to predators. So if you have mesic areas, you know, thicker, like where they are down here, they don't necessarily, um, unless it's a very dry year, have to travel very far to get to that habitat. But if you're in the middle of an area where there's very little mesic habitat, um, you have to travel pretty far with a bunch of sticks and that makes them open for predators, or at least more open uh, to predation versus you didn't have to travel quite as far. So traditionally, the ways to fix, fix mesic and riparian areas has been um, pretty intensive. They're generally large projects with large machinery, um, large amounts of money, a lot of engineering is involved and a lot of permitting and other um, hoops that you have to jump through to, to get this sort of work done. So a lot of money doesn't really generally go a long way with this type of uh, mesic restoration. However, recently and in the future, we're hoping to use um, these kind of low input mesic restoration. We have the Z-dike type structures uh, that's in the upper left there with the rocks as well as beaver dam analogs in the lower right. And they're very similar in that they use whatever material is easily available. You can see that um, in the beaver dam analog that there are pine trees being used to weave through the posts that can just as easily be willows or sagebrush um, or what other woody stemmed thing you have available in the area. Um, and the z deck structures can be used with whatever local rock again, that's available. Uh, they do work a little bit differently. z dikes tend to uh, help habitat that's downstream of them, whereas beaver dam analogs are hold, trying to hold a little bit of water back, slow the water down, and kind of fix what's upstream of the projects. But with a combination of these um, low energy uh, fixes, I think we can really get a long way in the future. Um, one of the benefits besides being low cost uh, is that there's generally fairly easy to get a permit for these things, um, especially if you, the other folks along SGI have had success with involving the Army Corps of Engineers early on in the process um, so that they know what's going on and what they're trying to do. 
And we've seen um, just in the last couple of years, uh, these really pop up all over the place and help quite a bit with these domestic area restoration. Um, so that's the end of the threat checklist, but there are a couple other threats that aren't really addressed on that, um, that we do still help address while we are doing the sage grouse initiative planning. Big one that was again very obvious this year was drought and fire. Um, as you can see, Montana, this is act or up to date as of last Tuesday, and Montana is still an extreme drought um, or exceptional drought, and quite a bit of it, um, even though we just got about two and a half to three inches of rain um, in some of those areas. So, but what makes you more resilient to drought is having better rain sustainability, which comes from this grazing management. So anytime that we are able to implement a grazing plan, we are helping that ranch uh, be more sustainable in the cases of drought. And with fire, although again, there's only so much grazing can do with that, I had mentioned before that sheepgrass and Japanese brome can often contribute to fire starting um, and fire spreading quickly. And Better grazing management uh, often decreases the presence of those grasses. Uh, and if you have more mesic areas and more water on the landscape, you're less likely to burn as well. So that comes down to kind of this grazing management as well. Um, some things that aren't necessarily in our general ranch plan, but is still part of SGI, is using easements. And those are really helpful for this ex-urban or kind of suburbia development. Uh, more and more folks are starting to realize that they want to keep their ranching lands um, to stay ranching. Uh, so easements are put on to allow them to do everything that they need in a day-to-day -day life of ranching, but uh, will prevent any subdivision of that property down the road um, for eternity, basically. Uh, so no subdivision of that property and generally very little buildings um, are allowed to go up after the on. Isn't as big of an issue in my area uh, because, well, we don't have mountains to look at, so <laughs> we don't have so many people that are wanting to build up here, which is a good thing. Keep those large tracks, but it's been certainly an area um, of concern in the southeastern part of the state and even more central uh, part of the state. Another place easements can come in handy is cropland conversion. Uh, I mentioned that we already have lost habitat in the Golden Triangle where wheat is very um, grown quite a bit in Montana. And again, that are, there are areas that are continuing to get cropland conversion, um, although it does seem to depend quite a bit on what the price of uh, wheat often or whatever the cash crop is this time, what the price is there. And that's another area where easements and Simmons saying that, you know, Busting, sod busting is not allowed on a certain chunk of property. But even after uh, something is cropped, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Uh, recently, uh, Sagegrass Initiative has been doing some reseeding projects. So these are native seedings um, that occur on previously cropped land and they've worked really well. This is actually, picture was taking a year and a half after it was seeded and I think it was a over 12 different seeds in the area a mix of grasses as well as forbs um, that's flax flowers that you're seeing in the picture um, and this was a project that was over 4,000 acres so in core habitat so this is a huge chunk of habitat that is now available for sage grouse um, and it's, again certainly the rancher is quite happy with it he didn't want to crop it anymore um, and now he gets this large forage bank for his cows as well. Um, so they're certainly not all this large, but every little bit that we can get seeded back to native grass and native forbs will help in you know, both uh, sage grouse and the cows. So that's kind of the basis of what Sage Grouse Initiative has been doing in Montana. Um, and we haven't met a ton of resistance with this project in part because of all the partnerships that are involved. Um, there are state agencies, federal agencies, uh, NGOs, ranchers and landowners are a big portion of it. Uh, if we didn't have so many people at the table, uh, we wouldn't be as successful as we are. Um, and 
So it's a quick note, it, it did amuse me when I tried to get a list of partners that SGI involves. There's a condensed partners list because there's literally over 25, 30, 40 partners um, across the 11 Western states. And you can see all their different categories that they have available there. Uh, and having this many partners leads to a big toolkit and leads to more flexibility because if there's something that um, NRCS can't get done for whatever reason through that SGI contract, you know, it might be possible for an NGO to come in with some funds they will hope that they can do a project or contribute funds towards a project. So then having all these people in um, has really helped with the flexibility of Sage Grass Initiative. And the end of that, or the kind of end game, I guess, has been that we're showing that ground up conservation works. Um, as I've said multiple times now, if it wasn't a win-win situation for both the landowners and the birds or the sage grouse ecosystem, it would not be as successful um, as it has been. But we're showing that uh, including the folks that are on the ground um, or own the ground, as it is often the case, uh, can actually be um, much more beneficial than having this top-down regulation and makes people much more willing to work with folks. And so I guess the thought that I'll leave you with is one of SGI's favorite sayings of what's good for the herd is good for the bird. Again, we would not be able uh, to get this much done on rangelands if we weren't help, able to help the landowners as well as the bird. Um, and speaking of partnerships, there's actually quite a bit that go into my position. Um, so they're listed there for y'all. And I think with that, I am ready to take any questions. Thanks very much for the great presentation, Heather. That was really awesome. I know I learned a lot. To any of our listeners out there, you're welcome to type in any questions you have for Heather into the webinar dashboard. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to note that um, at the end of this webinar, everyone will receive an email with a quick questionnaire. It'll just take a minute. So if our participants out there would be willing to fill that out, that would be great, and that'll help PCAP continue on with webinars like this in the future. It looks like we do have a question or comment, uh, or question, sorry, um, from a listener. What is the annual budget for SGI? Oh, it's in, I don't have the exact number, but it's in the millions. Um, so even in just in Montana alone, uh, I mean, my office in the past five or six years has contracted 3.7 million out. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I don't have that number right off the top of my head, um, but it's probably millions of year per state that's enrolled in SGI. Um, so it's it's definitely a large large amount of money that we're able to work with, and that's part of the reason we're able to be successful as well as able to get a lot of projects done. Thanks, Heather. Uh, there is a question from a listener named Michelle. Do chicks require any other habitat for food than the mesic, and how can we alter grazing around them? So it's generally thought that the mesic is the important part, that yes, they will also use um, the kind of general sagebrush habitat, but mesic is by far uh, that critical habitat. And the grazing, like I said, providing more water sources kind of away from these lowland areas is certainly going to help. Um, in some cases, creating a specific riparian pasture might help. Not that you're uh, keeping cows out all the time, but that you're allowing cows to go in. They spend, you know, a week or two weeks on, in that riparian pasture, um, use whatever AUMs are available, and then they're off. And that gives that pasture plenty of time to recover and plenty of time uh, for the insects and for life to uh, kind of still be around and recover as well and gives those chicks that habitat. Thanks, Heather. Um, there's a comment here from a listener named Ori. Great webinar, thank you. Will the presentation and notes be available for reference online? Um, so PCAP posts all of our webinars on our YouTube channel 
and that's www.youtube.com slash user slash SKPCAP. And all of our listeners out there will get an email with that later today. Um, and then if anyone wanted to contact Heather directly, would that be okay, Heather, if people had questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Um, if any other listeners have questions, you're welcome to type that into the webinar dashboard. Um, oh, there's another one here. Is general wildlife friendly fencing considered a good fence? So a good fence for I'm cows? For cattle. Or, yes. Um, so yeah, so it is generally, I prefer um, to see you know, three strand barbed wire, but four strand barbed wire can still be made uh, wildlife friendly. Now, if you have sheep, uh, that is certainly a different issue. And we try to work with producers that do run sheep to kind of modify five strand barbed wire um, in places to make it passable for especially pronghorn to get through because they generally want to crawl underneath the fence. But yeah, I would say that uh, most ranchers have been happy with the fencing that uh, we that meets our specifications and that two strand hot wire fence too. We've had a, quite a few ranchers that have had a lot of luck with that um, as well. Great, thank you for that answer, Heather. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the great presentation. Um, just a reminder to check out PCAP's website um, for all of our listeners out there to click on the communications tab and Native Prairie Speaker Series for information about um, the upcoming events. And then to also check out PCAP's YouTube channel for recording of this video. And um, it will be on our PCAP Facebook page so you can pass on the link to anyone who's not able to make it today. So thank you, Heather, for the awesome presentation and thank you for our listeners for tuning in today. Thank you. Have a great day.